Hey, let's praise the Lord one more time in this place. Amen, amen. Hey, so glad that you guys are here with us today. If you don't know, my name is Dylan Robinson. I'm the campus pastor here at the Weld Church. We are one church in two locations. And uh, last Sunday night, we had a combined worship night here at the auditorium. And man, God moved. If you were here, you know what that was like. And so, uh, man, we're just so thankful that God is moving in the life of our church, not at just this location, but both locations. Uh, but before we get started in today's message, uh, I want to remind you, I want to prepare your hearts for the new year. Uh, so at the Weld Church, we do a 21-day prayer and fasting together collectively as a one church, and we want to encourage you guys to participate in this. If you're new to church or new um, to fasting, fasting is abstaining for, from food for a spiritual purpose. If you've never heard that before, you're like, y'all are crazy. Yes, we are, right? But we believe it's in the word, and we believe that God honors it. We'll continue to teach about what that's like, but we're going to start that January 2nd. Everybody say the 2nd. I know right now some of y'all are like, that doesn't apply to me. It does. Let the Lord speak to you. Uh, we have announcements about that. But also we have some packets about fasting in the lobby. If you're here today and then you are curious about what fasting is or you say, you know, I've heard about it for a while, but I've just never done it myself. And you're curious of, of, of what that's like and, and how to do that. Stop by the, uh, the kiosk, the connection kiosk before you leave and get the fasting packet. Because we truly believe, I'm not just saying this, I truly believe that God honors prayer and fasting. And we have years of records of watching God, look up at me, God healing marriages, setting people free, man, bring financial blessings through prayer and fasting. If you believe that, say amen. I'm telling you, I'm not just preaching this. I have watched it where God honors that. So if you're here and you're like, man, I need something new, begin to pray and consider prayer and fasting for 21 days. And for the first few weeks, for the first three weeks, the first, or the Wednesday, excuse me, we'll be meeting at the depot here in town from seven to eight for prayer. So please join us there. We'll give you more information. But we're in this series called Christmas at the Well. Would you say that with me, please? Christmas at the Well. And what we're looking at is coming and worshiping the Lord. As I said, last Sunday night, we had our combined worship night. It was so awesome being here. But I just want to make sure you guys get these days before you. So if you put the, the next slide up. So on Sunday, December 18th, we are going to be having our pancakes and PJs. And so, man, it, parents, if you want to come and eat some pancakes and, and wear your PJs, right? I know you're just dying to wear your PJs to church. Come and do that. If you want to change before service, you can do that. But come, and we're going to do that before service. That'll be at 10 a.m. And then we have... On December 23rd, our candle light service. I promise you, it's not a real candle. We would get kicked out of here really quick. But we'll have these uh, fake candles, right? That's what we do here at the well. Man, we're going to have these fake candles. But, man, it's going to be a special time as we remember, man, God sending his son. So that is going to be our main Christmas service. So that's a Friday night at 7 o'clock. You do not want to miss. And then on Sunday, Christmas morning, the 25th, we'll be having our family Christmas online. So we'll have a new message online in worship. Um, so we will not be in person. But we want to make sure that you guys have those dates. That way you know what's coming. But Christmas at the well. Come and worship the Lord. Man, we believe that Christmas, more than anything else, is about worship. Amen? It, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is, man, Christmas is God sending his one and only son to the world. That way we can have life in him and life to the fullest. Man, he is the perfect lamb of God. He is the one who took our place on that cross, died for you and I. And so what it reminds us is how God loves us so much. And so in return, we worship him. Last week, we looked at the story of the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. Man, it says this. It says in verse 14, glory to God in the highest heaven. And what we looked at is how, man, at the arrival of Jesus, you have the presence of Jesus, which is him himself, but you have the glory around him. And how God sent the, the shepherds to go and worship Jesus. But it's this idea that also the shepherds went glorifying God for all the things that they had seen and done. And just like the shepherds, who knows that we are called to go and glorify God, what not only he's done in the shepherds' lives, but what he's done in our lives. You should be able to look back and see what God has done and the glory that surrounds it. But today, if you're taking notes, I'm going to be preaching a message called Praise the Lord. Would you say that with me, please? Praise the Lord. You know, we use that expression quite often, praise the Lord, right? But most of the time it's praise God I didn't get a speeding ticket. Come on, somebody, right? Oh, praise God that didn't happen, right? Oh, oh, well, praise the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with saying it, but oftentimes we're not truly giving God praise. 
Now, sometimes we are. Sometimes things will happen where you hear, man, good news from the doctor. You hear good news in, in someone's life, and you say, oh, man, praise the Lord. And this idea of praise the Lord is giving God thanks. But what's the difference between praise and worship? Raise your hand if you've ever heard praise and worship before. I'm just curious. Lift a hand so that way I know who I'm talking to. So you've heard this expression, praise and worship. Well, they're, they're, they're used synonymously, but, man, they, there's truly a difference there. Praise is this idea of giving God thanks and appreciation for what he has done. Worship is, is reverence or having this allness about who God is. So worship is who God is. So, God, as we are truly worshiping you in this place, I mean, we're, we're, we recognize that you are a holy God. And so, God, we just worship you for who you are. Praise is, is giving God thanks. And while the, they can be overlapped at times, there is a difference. Maybe you've heard that sometimes praise in, in the worship set, just as we heard, we start off with an upbeat song and, and then it kind of goes down. Why do we do that? Because we're giving God praise for what he's done. Clearly that's worship, but it's this idea that we're making sure to say, thank you, Lord. Joyful, joyful, right? It's this upbeat reminder what God has done. But as we gravitate in the, in the song selection, it's this idea that, man, look at what he's done. King of heaven, be enthroned on this earth. It's this idea that we are in the presence of God. But who knows, God not only deserves our praise and worship on Sundays, but every day. Come on, somebody. Man, even on Monday when you don't wanna wake up when your alarm goes off, but man, you hear that, you smell that coffee and you're like, Lord, you're gonna get me through today. It's this reminder that I'm gonna praise the Lord not just when life is going good, but even in the hardships, I'm gonna praise God because my God is deserve, deserving of my praise. Today, we're gonna to be looking at Luke chapter one. If you have your Bible, you can go there if you wanna look up on the screen. But Luke chapter one, verses 46 through 55. Today, we're gonna to be looking at Mary's song of praise. Now, in all my years of preaching, I know I'm young, but I've been preaching a while now. I've never preached a sermon just on this. And so I'm excited. And it, it, there's kind of some unique points within this. But it's this idea that, that Mary just praised God for what she was able to, to do who she was able to be. But before we pick up the story, I wanna give you some context. At this point in time, I mean, the, the, the story of John the Baptist is, is foretold. Zechariah, his father, is in the temple doing his duties and, and the angel Gabriel showed, appeared to him. And him and, and, and Elizabeth were old in age and they were not able to have children and, and, Ab and Gabriel comes and tells Zechariah that they are going to be able to have a son. And his name's gonna be called John. And he's gonna be John the Baptist, the baptizer of going and, and preparing the way of the Lord. At the same time, or different time, but around the same time frame, God goes and he speaks to Mary and Joseph about Jesus and how Mary is going to have the virgin birth. Does anybody still believe in the Bible that the word is true? I believe it. She's gonna have a virgin birth but they're cousins and they have no idea that this is gonna happen. They live about 100 miles away from one another. And so it's not like they could just FaceTime real quick. It's not like they could get in the car and go see each other. So man, Mary goes 100 miles to go and talk to Elizabeth. Mary has this news that she is going to give birth to the Son of God, and you think your week was hard. She was a teenager. Some scholars believe as young as 13, some believe 17 or 18. That's the context. Mary hears this, it's like, oh my goodness. And as Mary approaches Elizabeth, the baby in, in Elizabeth's stomach be begins to, to leap for joy. John the Baptist, though in, is a baby and in the womb, begins to leap and, and the word says that she begins to be filled with the Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, being filled with the Spirit of God normally came with prophecy. And so in this moment, Elizabeth begins to look at Mary and says, oh my goodness, I'm paraphrasing this, but man, how amazing is it that you are going to be the mother of God? And how crazy is it that we're cousins and that I'm gonna be giving birth to the forerunner of Jesus? With that in mind, you would understand why Mary has praise. See, guys, if we're not careful, we'll read the word of God and say, yep, got it. But I want you to empathize. I want you to contextualize this idea of all this taking place. Have you ever received news, even good news? You're excited, you're honored, 
But what do you do? You want to share it with someone. It's going to change everything. What does it look like? What's the future going to entail? What about this? Can you imagine the angels appearing to you, your cousins, and you're going to be raising two of the most significant people this world has ever seen? With that in mind, verse 46, Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. Verse 51, his mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful, for he has made this promise to our ancestors and to Abraham and his children forever. There's so much there where we've read before, and we just kind of go, okay, that's good. But man, I want you to know it's rich. Would you pray with me one more time? God, we come into prayer. And God, we do praise you, not because it's something we say, but God, we've seen what you've done in our lives. We've seen what you're doing in this church. And the byproduct of that is, God, we say thank you. But God, we also worship you for who you are and all your majesty and all your splendor. God, would you have your way today? We love you so much and pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Man, God's been speaking to me this week. Have you ever received a gift that there's just no way you could ever repay somebody? Raise your hand. Come on, somebody. I'm just curious. Raise your hand. You received a gift you'll just never be able to repay. You can put it down. Maybe it's, it's uh, material. Maybe you know, something physical. Or maybe it's, it was emotional. Maybe somebody complimented you. Man, that was a gift. Somebody said, man, you just really meant a lot to you. Maybe it was somebody just taking a chance on you. And man, you didn't know if, if it would all work out. Many of you have heard my story, but... For me, the, the, probably the most significant gift I've ever received, besides being able to, to marry my bride and my two ch- having my two children, when Pastor Selena, before it was Pastor Selena and, and her husband John and their two kids, Caden and Corinna Caden, is up here playing the bass today. When they took me in their house when I was 16 years old, it was a gift that I could never repay them. I won't get into all the details, but at that point in my life, I was addicted to drugs, drugs pretty heavily. I was getting high every day. There's a three-month time around this time period that, man, I wasn't sober. I was about to drop out of high school. I was getting in some serious trouble. I knew where I was headed. Many of you have heard this. Some of you have not. You can't make this up. My junior year, I got put on a type of house arrest where you're just sitting there at home because they won't let you leave. And I'm watching the show Cops. I want you to think about the irony right there. I'm in trouble, and I know where I'm headed, but I don't think there's anything I could ever do about it. And God changed my heart one night on February 21st of uh, 2010, radically transformed my life. But in that, I had a lot of healing to do. There's a lot of things in my life that I didn't quite know how God was going to really do it. And one of those things was, was putting people around me. I, had, I have some amazing family, and, and at that point in time, I was staying with my grandparents a lot, but I was just kind of doing my own thing. And I wasn't looking to live anywhere, but I needed some godly people to to point me to Jesus. And Pastor Selena, who was my youth pastor at the time, and her husband John and their two kids were those people who were constant in my life. I would come to their house and we'd sit around and we would eat and we did that a lot. And then we would talk about Jesus and they would ask me things about my life and I'd never really opened up with anybody. And, And I'll never forget one day after school, I went to go and hang out with them. And after being there all night long, I would go and I'd have my backpack and I would stay with a friend or a family member or something like that. I was always on the go. But one day, I'll never forget, I went to their house after school and Selena brought me down along with John and they were taking me down into their son Caden's toy closet. I'm like, I sure hope they don't kill me right now. I don't know what's going down. I was new to this whole church thing and I was like, man, Caden's, he's probably mad at me, right? And they took me into his toy room, but it was no longer a toy room. Caden, I'm sorry. It was my stuff. 
It was, my, it was the bed that they got for me. There was pictures on the wall. There were clothes, and my clothes hung up. And, and they said this. I'll never forget it. They said, Dylan, it's yours if you want it. This family just allowed me in, and there were pastors in this town. There were other people in town that said, do not let that kid live with you. He will ruin your life. I'm here to say all these years later, man, praise God that somebody took a chance and listened to God's voice rather than man and woman's, woman's voice. And so for me to be here today preaching the word at the school that I got kicked out of a lot. And to be able to do worship, or believe me, I wasn't on the worship, I'm not on the worship team. But to be able to be here, a part of the worship service with Cade and now my wife and all these people. I'm telling you, the Lord has just been reminding me this week, he's been good to me. And i got to praise him for what he's done. But there was a gift that I needed, but I couldn't repay that's just the best type of gifts, isn't it? It's not just the ones that we want. It's the ones that we need. And I'm here to tell you today, as amazing as that was, there is no better gift on this earth. And it's not just for me, but it's for everyone. And it's the gift called Jesus Christ that leads us to salvation. And I'm telling you, if you're a newborn Christian today, you know you got a lot to praise God for. Well, it's, it hasn't been a good year. No, but man, we serve a good God. And that's what we're looking at here today, is Christmas reminds us to praise the Lord for what he's done. Let me ask you a question today. It's rhetorical, but I don't want it to be rhetorical. Are you grateful or are you hateful? Come on, preach somebody. Bunch of hateful people sometimes. <laughs> Feeling convicted right now, aren't you? I'm playing, kind of. Man, are we grateful? Because if I'm not careful, I can walk around and be a little bit hateful. Not real. Oh, I'm good in the, in the name of Jesus. I smile, but in my heart, I'm like, would you move? I'll be walking in the mall, and Maddie's like, would you chill? I'm like, no. We'll be going. And, man, if I'm not careful, I can become great or hateful. But, guys, I'm just I'm curious. I'm playing games a little bit. Let's be, let's be more real. In your daily lives, are the people around you drawn to Jesus or turned away from Jesus by the way that you represent him. See, we just read Luke chapter one, and we're gonna break it down. And the first thing I wanna look at here today, based on the words of Mary, I think there's three things that we can really take away. The first thing is this, praise the Lord for his salvation. Somebody say salvation. What is salvation? It truly means to rescue, is what it means. But in this in this verse in this context, it's this spiritual implication that we were, we were sinful. This is for everyone. That we, we don't believe that we were born good. We, we believe that we were born bad. We were sinners in need of a Savior. If that offends you, can I tell you, sorry. It's true, though. Well, I'm a good person. No, you're not. How do you base that off? I base it off the Word of God, and I base it off little kids. Especially mine. But see, we need a savior, and God knew that. When he created us in the beginning, in Genesis, Adam and Eve sinned, and since then we inherited a sinful nature. And so all the time since then, God has been making a way for us to be forgiven. In the Old Testament, he would begin to allow animal sacrifice to allow us to begin to be forgiven and loved by the blood that was spilled and so Jesus coming, while it was so remarkable, him being in the manger, and it was so special and so beautiful and so innocent, can I tell you, the reason that baby came was to be slaughtered on that cross. Dylan, that's not very cheerful and bright. No, it's not. That's why he came. He came for one reason, one re reason only, and that's to bring us salvation. In the Catholic faith, and if you're, if you're Catholic here today, if you grew up Catholic, we love you. I, I believe you can absolutely be in a right relationship with Jesus. But I'm here to tell you this idea that, the, that Mary was just immaculate. There was an immaculate conception that she was not sinful. Can I tell you, that is not true. Here, look here, verse 40, for, uh, 47, excuse me, says this. Yeah, God, my Savior. How, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Not, you know, Mary wasn't like, yeah, them shepherds, they need a Savior. She said, God, my Savior. 
meaning, God, I need salvation. Think about this. Here's a different way to put it, and this is gonna blow your mind. Maybe you understand this theologically, but you've never heard about it. Listen up. The, the very baby that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was going to give birth to was the very person that would deliver his mom from sin. Do you understand how theologically profound that is? That God sent his son into this earth to die for us. But he came to this lowly girl, scripture teaches, to this teenage girl to give birth to. And absolutely, salvation is for all people. But what is so amazing about this birth is that the same baby that was going to come out of this woman would be the same baby who died on the cross and would forgive her of her sins. So when you begin to realize that Mary is praising God, she had no idea what everything would entail. She had no idea what would take place. But in that moment, she realized that, man, he came to bring salvation in this world. And here's the problem with the American church. I'm not just trying to throw a stone at us. But I'm here to tell you, the problem with this is we hear that and we see that and say, yep, Jesus offers salvation. Can I tell you, or might I say this, can I remind you that when you didn't know that there was a Savior named Jesus Christ who came to earth because he loved you and had you in mind and was there with you in your brokenness and he died for you, it does something to you. That night, I was so overwhelmed with the presence of God. I was so overwhelmed with the glory of God. And it wasn't a good worship band at all. God bless their efforts. It wasn't an amazing sermon. It was prayer. Who believes there's power in prayer in this place? Why are we praying? Why are we fasting? Because there's Dylans and there's Jakes and there's Brendans and there's other people out there who need to be able to be invaded by the grace of God and it might be a prayer that we offer to change our lives. Salvation. That night that I got saved, I stood up and one of my friends was getting baptized. It was like midnight, man. There's no party like a Holy Ghost party, I'm telling you. He's like, I'm getting baptized now. They're like, well, it's midnight. You want to wait? He goes, no. They're like, these guys are crazy. I get up and I go to John, Pastor Sweeney's husband. I said, hey. I was rough around the edge back then. Hey. I don't know why I'm yelling, but that's what I did. Hey. How did I get saved? Bro. He was like, dear Lord Jesus, help me. <laughs> he begins to explain it to me. He goes, but you gotta mean it. I said, okay. He said, repeat these words after me. I said, okay. And I repeat these words. And I look at him. I go, am I good? He goes, did you mean it? I said, yeah. He goes, then you're good. I said, good. My friend gets out of the baptism. He looks at me. He goes, you need to get baptized. I said, you ain't gotta tell me twice, man. I guys, I tell you that here today because as I hold my little baby boy and my little girl, I'm so reminded this week that God has been so good to me. I'm just so thankful for him. And sometimes, man, I, I make myself a little bit more important than what I am. Sometimes I get so busy with church work. And here's what I want you to know. If God has not done anything, if God doesn't do anything else for me or hasn't done anything else for you, the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross, that is enough. Come on, somebody. But see, she says, I'm just a lowly servant girl. Anybody ever felt like that? I'm just lowly, man. I mean, yeah, God, you'll, you'll use those people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, but man, I'm just this lonely girl. I'm just this lowly boy. I got a tainted past, man. I'm just not very smart. I'm not very gifted like those people. Praise God, the church is for all people, not just some. 
Praise God that Jesus came and that there were shepherds represented. There were magi who were pagan people represented. And meanwhile, the Pharisees weren't even to be around. That's here to remind us here today that God is looking to pour out his spirit meant to those who know that they need a savior. If you're walking around here and you say, well, I don't really see God moving in my life. I don't really think that, that God's actually done that much. Can I tell you, maybe you've been looking for the wrong things in this world. Because we got to come lowly before God and say, Lord, I need you. See, when, when troubles arise, when, when, when obstacles happen, I'm not saying they're always fun and they're not always, and that they're easy. But what I am telling somebody is they are an amazing opportunity to be desperate for God. The reason I love fasting and prayer so much, first of all, I hate fasting. Let me be clear. I, I hate abstaining from food. I don't like that part. If you do, God bless you. But there's something about saying, God, I want you more than food. God, I want you more than my social media. God, I want you more than the things of this world because, Lord, I want more of you and less of me. Come on, somebody. Listen, we don't need more high-energy messages. I know I'm high-energy right now. But what I'm telling you is we've got to just fixate our eyes on Jesus and say, I want more of him. And here Mary, this teenage girl, man, just heard this news that, man, I can't even imagine her hearing is scared, is worried, knowing that her husband might leave her. But in this, she recognizes how the Lord saw her in her lowly place. And I wanna remind somebody here today, if you're walking around feeling like, man, that God can't use you because you've messed up too much and you're just lowly, of course he can use him or her, but he can't use me. Can I tell you, that is a lie straight from the pit of hell because the Christmas story reminds us that Jesus is for the lowly people. And God can use the lowly people, I believe. And I'm not talking status. I'm talking in your heart posture. He can use lowly people in such greater ways because we're not proud, but we know we're nothing without him. The second thing I think we see in this scripture is that she praises the Lord for his mercy. For the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. He has shown me mercy from generation to generation. All who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things and he has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. I want everybody to say from generation to generation. Say it with me. From generation to generation. What series did we come out of in, in, in this giving campaign? Generation to generation. We're talking about from Abraham to Jesus. There's about a 2,000 year span there. And why is Mary saying this? Right after that she heard that she was going to be the mother of Jesus. And right after she goes and sees Elizabeth and, and John leaps within Elizabeth's belly. Why is it that she begins to say, he has shown me mercy from, from, mercy from generation to generation? Because what she was doing, being filled with the Spirit of God, was recognizing this is not a usual birth. I think we'd all agree, the virgin birth is not usual. But not only did she know that it was an unusual birth, she was recognizing that in that moment, she was a part of history. Stay with me. In that moment, she realized that at the beginning of time, when God created Adam and Eve and they sinned, and that God was creating a sacrificial system for us to be forgiven. And then after those years, as God continued to raise up the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and other people. But then there was 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they're waiting for a sign. They're waiting to hear that our, our Savior will come and rescue us. At this point in time, the Jews were under the Romans' authority. They were at a lowly place in history. Dylan, that's a lot of context, I know. But it sets the stage for this. It sets the stage that as she's filled with the Spirit of God, she realizes that God has fulfilled his plan. Can I tell somebody here today, if God has made a promise, he will follow through on that plan every single time. 
But notice how she uses the word mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. I like to put it like this. Grace is receiving what we do not deserve. Mercy is not receiving what we do deserve. Listen, if that doesn't do anything to you, if you're like, you got anything else, preacher man? No. We do not deserve Jesus. But what we do deserve is the cross that Jesus was on. But Jesus took that upon himself so that way we don't have to live with the sin and the shame and the consequences of our past. To God be the glory. But see, notice, and it sounds a little bit random. It says that he has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. Stay with me. I know it's a little bit different. Not only was she talking to that group of people for that place of time. There were so many leaders, so many kings and princes who tried to take away the Jewish people. And this was God saying, listen, I'm a God of the covenants. I will fulfill it. But the the other part of that is what I think applies to you and I here today is this idea that there's so many of us that sit up on our own thrones and we think that it's my life, I'll do whatever I want, God's fine with it, and listen, I'll just kind of have to ask God just to kind of figure it out later on. He can kind of fix all my mistakes and things like that. And here's what I need you to know. God will forgive you of your sins, but sometimes you gotta live with your consequences. I'm gonna say, ouch. I think sometimes, stay with me. It's where I feel like the Lord's led me today. I think so many times, because we live in a hyper grace culture and society, and I want you to know that it is by the grace of God that we are saved. It is not deeds. You cannot earn your way into heaven. But here's what I think. Here's where I think we're at as a culture. Here's where I think we're at as a society. We will do whatever we want, whenever we want, how we want it, and we'll just ask God to forgive me and we'll be good. And here's what I need you to know. While God will absolutely forgive you and give you grace and mercy, some of you, you're living in the consequences of your sins. And I'm not telling you this so that way you'll beat yourself up, but I'm telling you this, that way you understand God not only wants to save you, but he wants to transform you and he wants to give you a way of living that you never knew about. Come on, someone. Worship team, if you'll come. I see a lot of people, I see a lot of young people and older people walk around, maybe even here today. I mean, you you so understand this Christmas story. You get that God loves us and sent his son to die for us and, and all that. I mean, you love hearing about the shepherds and you love hearing about the magi and all that's great, Pastor. But listen, I'm gonna kind of do my own thing. I'm over here, I'm I'm, I'm doing this and praise God that Jesus came and he died for me and and, and, and he saves me and, and forgives me, that's great. But here's what I want you to know here today. I'm not trying to be hurtful. I'm not trying to be too strong, but I'm trying to be faithful to the message of God. There comes a point in time, stay with me people in the back, people up here, young, old, male, female. Just trying to be obedient today. There comes a point in time, and I say this with a burdened heart. Ma'am, sir, mom and dad. There comes a point in time When enough is enough. And letting God invade those areas of our hearts to where we begin to not only receive his grace and mercy, but we receive his spirit that allows us to walk around, not as the slaves of sin any longer, but slaves of righteousness. And I am reminded this week that 
I think one of the greatest threats upon our culture, society, is that we're good with baby Jesus in the manger. Matter of fact, we're good with grown Jesus on the cross. But I want you to know, what also makes Christmas and Easter so powerful is Pentecost Sunday where we have the same spirit that Christ has. If you're with me, say yes. So why church? I'm not trying to come down on anybody. I'm saying the, the church at large. Why are we walking around as if Jesus is still in the manger? And I love reflecting back on what God has done, but I want you to know that we can't stay here because he, he ended up growing up and he died on that cross, but he rose again three days later. But man, he ended up giving us his Holy Spirit. That way we can have life and life to the fullest. And I need to remind you today, this Christmas season, man, it is time to start living like the same God then is the same God now. And he is with me today. I'm ready to watch God reconcile people. I'm, I'm believing that God wants to bring revival in this community and in this world. And it ain't gonna happen just by looking back at the Christmas story and saying, oh, praise God for that. But I'm telling you, that's just chapter one. He came as a boy, but he came as a man eventually. And then he came as spirit. that, my friend, is where we begin to experience the power of God, unlike we've ever seen before. I want you to stand as we go over this last point. Stay with me. Last thing. The third thing we see is praise the Lord for his provision. It says that he filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful for he has made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. You gotta understand, she hears this news and praises God for his salvation, praises God for his mercy upon Israel, but all of mankind, but him. She said, praise God that he filled me. Listen, God has kinda taken me on a different direction this morning. And here's where I wanna end. Are you hungry today? Some of y'all are like, yeah, if you quit preaching, I'm about to go get some food. But I'm saying, are you hungry today? Are you hungry today? Are you hungry for a move of God in your life? Are you hungry to have victory in your life? Are you tired of just letting the enemy tell you who you are? And who you're not. Are you tired of being bound and broken and addicted and you're walking around bitter and you're walking around wondering why these people are this and these people are this? Here's what I want to tell you today. God is looking to set people free in this place. We're not going to just idolize this season and just reflect upon the baby. Listen, praise God for that. See, Elizabeth told Mary this. Praise God that you have believed what God has told you about your boy. And she didn't know everything that was going to take place. But she said right there, Lord, I trust you. I don't understand you. I don't know what it's going to what it's going to look like, but I believe you. God's calling you some of you elsewhere jobs. God's raising up some of you where you're at. Some of you are going to be graduating high school, looking to work or go to school or both. Some of you are looking to start having kids. Some of y'all are looking to not have kids anymore. Some of y'all are looking to get plugged into the church. Some of you are looking for this Christmas season to be different. Here's what I want to tell you today. God will provide. He wants to save you. He wants to give you mercy. But he wants to provide. And here's what I, what I want to do. I want you to close your eyes. But we're going to be bold this morning. We're going to be bold this morning. I'm not looking to create an emotional scene. I'm just looking to give somebody
inviting invitation. If you're here in this place, Maybe you believe the lie that you're not enough and that God can't use you and you're too limited, you're too normal, you're too messy. But you are ready to take a step of faith and say, God, I want you to have my yes. Give him your sin. Give him your temptation. Give him your anger. Give him your brokenness. I want you to come down right now. I just want you to seek it. I don't care who you are, where you're at. Anyone in this place, say, I just want him. I want him. Come right now, wherever you're at. Listen, we're here for you. This isn't anybody looking down on anybody. Listen. If you're here today, whatever he's dealing with you about, I want you to come right now. Seek him right now. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. your response when God speaks? Is it like Mary? Immediate praise. Some of you are here today, you're asking God for another sign. You're asking God to reveal himself again. And what he's telling you is, you don't need any more information. You need to believe what God's already revealed to you. Today, I want you to come down and pray.